Yeah. Go ahead, sir. So, Your Worship, uh, I don't have a printed report, and uh, as I was alluding to you during the technology presentation, we couldn't get uh, the printer to work this afternoon, so maybe we can get uh, some of these young folks to come back and, and help us <laughs> with that. Their first job so, is fix that printer. Yeah, my apologies, I don't have a printed report for you today. So, um, I, I will get that uh, when we solve our technology problem and circulate to Council. Any questions for the CAO today? Good, thank you, Jeff. Uh, fire department report. Nothing, yeah, you're gonna, is there anything to, uh, anything to report, sir? Your Worship, just to report to council that we are in the process of our search for a new uh, fire chief, and I hope to have uh, good news for you in the very near future. Good, thank you. Uh, operational services, uh, Chad LeBlanc, anything in Chad's report that raises any concerns, questions, ideas? Councilman McLeod. Hi, Chad. Just a, a minor question. I know that uh, the crosswalk and the bump out on the corner of Grand and Brunswick is all but complete. Are we actually going to install a uh, stop four-way stop at that point and I just was thinking about that I think it might be a good idea don't misunderstand me but there's also a four-way stop on the corner of Porter and Brunswick I'm just curious yeah about that. um, that's true so um, so there's no magic uh, manual right for these types of situations so um, I'm using my best judgment and some discretion here. So I made some observations over the course of the last six to eight weeks. And what I've observed is um, traffic is um, fairly, fairly yeah, right. fast in this area. I, I've, I've witnessed um, commercial vehicles <clears throat> and, and trucks and cars uh, traveling at a very, very, fairly rapid pace. And, but what I'm also witnessing um, during times of dismissal and arrival to the school, a lot of students are crossing Brunswick Street on the north side of that intersection, and mm -hmm. it's unsafe. And um, as much as I don't want two four-way stops within fairly close proximity, it'll be about 80 meters apart, I think at this point it's, it's the safest alternative for us. Um, because I think if we don't do something, um, an, an accident is inevitable. I think the only other comment I want to make about that, because as you can appreciate, I live near and nearby and I walk the area yeah. daily. Um, I think the parents of the students and the teachers and the teachers' aides and all the staff, they need to encourage um, the, uh, the parents or the people who pick up students to not cross the street except on crosswalks. True. Yeah. And that's a, what, what a wonderful way to teach the children that there's a, there's a crosswalk there. Even if it means walking 50 feet. We all like to go to the shortest distance as quickly as possible, but in this case, it, it's important to cross on crosswalks, especially also on Parade Street. I noticed that, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Applaud what you're doing. Your, your report is uh, well written and uh, we know what's going on. Okay. Thanks a lot, Chad. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Councillor Steve Perry. Oh, I just want to say thank you for uh, your help over the weekend. Obviously, we had a successful event with Candy Cane Lane, and I yeah. know yourself and uh, Todd and the parks crew and whatnot really, uh, you know, stepped up and helped out. Just got to look behind us to see the great job that you yeah, did. It was our pleasure. So yeah. Just want to say thank you for the job that you did. You're welcome. Good. Thank you, Chad. Um, Nothing else, thank you. Uh, planning department, either the CAO or chair of the PAC, has anything to add? Good, Jim? Good, thank you. Uh, asset management and infrastructure renewal, uh, Mr. Brophy, Mark. Any questions for Mark? You Come on up, Mark, if you wanna. Is this your first official uh, microphone with us? This is it. Okay, welcome Mr. Brophy. Go, anybody, got, anybody any questions for Mark, or you have anything in there that you want to highlight, Mark? Go ahead, Jim. Um, hello, Mark, and welcome. Thank you Thank very you. much. It looks like, based on your report, that we're going to have a water and sewer treatment or treat, uh, upgrade next summer. 
uh, the design and planning will start? We won't be starting the program to do the actual replacement. It's not, I haven't looked at the capital uh, report yet, or it's not available oh, to us. We you have know. to procure a consultant first, and there's, that's going to take some time. Uh, good. It, I can but tell uh, there's lots of preparation going on. I can tell that. This is kind of a planning and design year, and yeah. the following year we can hit the construction. Yeah. The real construction activity should be in the ferry terminal. We, should, we will see that. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Mark. Anything else for Mark? Or, okay, Councillor Hood. Uh, Mark, the fire hall renovations. We uh, recently had a meeting with our volunteers, and uh, a number of them expressed uh, uh, had questions about the status of that project. And uh, it's your report indicates the concept is for second floor renovation is being developed. How far away were we getting? from getting that done. Uh, we actually met, we met an a architect this week and who, who was, who was their, their job is to do a preliminary concept of what could happen and some preliminary budgets. Uh, the problem is the renovation, the second floor is not, it's not that hard, but the life safety systems, fire separations, that's bigger cost than renovation. So we're trying to get an initial concept of what it could look like with a budget and then go next step. So can we, can we get some kind of a timeline, worst case scenario estimate on We're going to have this report within two weeks, and then we'll at least we'll have, we'll have a starting point. All right, good. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything you want to point out, Mark, or anything that uh, you find interesting in there, or anything we should know? Well, this is just a list. Again, it's the planning year. I've been here two weeks, so it's uh, it's uh, I'll, 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 give me a you little mean bit. You haven't got it done yet. I need a little bit of a learning curve. But, okay. Uh, uh, looking forward to selling my house in Dartmouth and get and moving in here for good. So uh, very excited to start. Good. We're happy to have you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, finance department, Jerry. submitted the September and October statements. Um, have, a, have a few, I guess, concerns I've discussed with uh, Jeff and we'll be discussing with staff about a plan, uh, maybe to alter the budget a little bit, but right now, and it's just, it's just a matter of a few things that have caught my eye, uh, things like uh, still owning the high school, uh, so operational costs for there. So there's a few areas where I think we're gonna be over budget on the expense side couple areas will be a little light on the revenue side so I'm gonna meet with the uh, directors and see what we can do with our our budgets to try to come up with a plan to uh, to figure out the uh, and manage the bottom line for now uh, I'll be looking probably to talk with you and maybe a little more detail once we have that plan in a couple weeks time and later on in this meeting I'll be discussing the capital budget with you so maybe in a couple weeks we can organize another special community of the whole meeting to deal with the uh, both the uh, capital plan and a follow-up of our uh, budget kind of revisions. Good. Uh, I just have. Jim. I understand that maybe we now or will own the Centertown School on or about January the 1st. Um, if that's true, is there a way that we, couldn't we just, uh, since it wasn't given to two people, it's just given to one person, couldn't we just say we didn't receive it and we, want, we don't want to have the school until about 2025? I've had a couple of discussions with our CAO and I'll let him respond to that one. <laughs> don't mean to embarrass anybody, but that's... No, uh, we are going to talk about that. That is the property item that I want to discuss in camera. There's some uh, legal issues around that uh, and... Uh, yeah, just need some direction from council. And how did we make out? We had a tax sale yesterday, Jerry. How did we, did all the properties? Uh, there were three nope. properties that went up for tax sale. And, all three go? Two sold, two sold. Um, I didn't have, don't have that list in front of me, the one that didn't. Uh, Jeff has it? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Not me? Oh, yes, it is. Um, so, uh, properties that sold, there was a piece of land, two and a half acres, I believe, over on Doan Street, mm -hmm. uh, off Doan Street, and then there was a property on Barnard Street 
that sold. There was a landlocked parcel off of Pleasant Street that did not sell. Good, thank you. Any other questions for the finance? No, thank you, Chair. Uh, Yarmouth Recreation Report, Frank. Anything, anything for F Mr. Grant today? Looks like you're off the hook, Frank. Thank yeah, economic development, uh, Natalie. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Natalie today? Councillor Cleveland. Not really a question, but a congratulations on the success of Merry Madness again this year. There was a big increase as far as ticket sales went, right? Because you, you increased the amount of tickets that were available, um, and it sold out. Yes, uh, we increased it uh, by about 53 tickets, so a total of 200 tickets were sold. Yep. Congratulations. It's another Thank you. good, uh, I don't know, just a, another good attempt to get people into the downtown, and it works. So thank you. You're welcome. Let's see if we can double that. Yeah, good. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, business uh, 8A Hospitality Policy Draft Version, CAO. Your Worship, uh, municipalities under uh, an amendment to the Municipal Government Act are required to have uh, a hospitality policy mm -hmm. and to report to the Minister on hospitality expenditures and to be transparent to the public on those expenditures. And so I've taken the uh, model policy developed by uh, AMA and NSFM in conjunction with the province and uh, I've inserted our name to, uh, to make it our own, put our own branding on it. Thank you, Lindsay. And so I'm recommending that you uh, consider adopting this policy at your December council meeting. If you have any uh, questions, comments, or concerns uh, today, we can take those and uh, at your pleasure make, make amendments uh, and bring forward uh, a final draft for the December council meeting. Councillor Hood. I just took a look at it quickly, and uh, I think you need to clarify the hospitality hospitality events. It, it says a, a hospitality event is a reception, ceremony, conference, or other event. There's a misspelling there that involves hosting individuals from outside the town. And I think that A, B, C, D, your sponsoring or hosting conferences, I assume if you leave it that way, that it's only for a, from outside of town, but here's the one, hosting ceremonies, recognition events. So we have recognition events here that are not confined to just people from outside of town frequently. Uh, I mean, what's the New Year's Day, right? That kind of thing. So I think maybe that needs to be looked at and tidied up to make it clear that some it isn't just I would assume it's not just for um, come from aways. <laughs> Poor word to use, but uh, seriously. So uh, maybe they intended it to be only restricted to that. I don't know. Comment, Jeff? Yep. So uh, again, this came from the model policy. So all input is, is welcome because not all circumstances, not all municipalities, uh, do the same things, but you're, you're quite right, uh, Councillor, in, in stating that we do hold events that are intended for residents, citizens of the town, uh, at which time we may want to provide hospitality, and so that policy statement may be too restrictive for that. One of the things that uh, I've talked to some of my colleagues about uh, their hospitality policies that they've adopted, and again, slightly different than, than, the, uh, than the model policy in places, is the fact that the whole, the whole idea of hosting, it is that you're hosting in your local community. So it would not support hosting, for instance, uh, Communities in Bloom uh, Committee, a delegation attended a conference uh, the year before we hosted to, to uh, entice participants to come here the next year. This would not necessarily or clearly um, uh, support that so that's something 
again, my colleagues were very clear that in their policies, it meant it had to be on their home turf that the event was held, and we want to make sure, I think, that our that we're open enough that when there are times that we, we want to host um, people who might come to our community when we're putting on a conference or you know, maybe it's a sporting event of national or inter international scope that we're able to go and put on a, a good uh, a presentation for our community which might involve some expenditure in the category of hospitality. So we'll make sure that that also, if that's your pleasure, that we'll ensure that's clear in our policy. Good. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so, Jeff, the next step for this is to uh, yeah. uh, move this forward to Town Council. I have a motion to, uh, with the clarification that Councillor Hood pointed out, I think you'll incorporate those, Jeff. I make a motion to proceed to Council. Moved by Councillor McLeod, seconded by Councillor Don Barry. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Uh, fall clearance compost. Uh, Jeff. Uh, Your Worship, we have a, um, a memo from the Manager of Public Works uh, whose, um, whose mandate includes overseeing the, uh, the operation of our compost facility. Uh, we have, uh, as, is, as is indicated in his memo, we have a significant amount of finished Class A compost at the facility, 3,500 cubic yards uh, estimated. And we do have limitations on how, on both storage space and under our operating agreement, how much we're, we're actually permitted to, to keep on site. So uh, our average annual sales are 208 cubic yards. So we have a significant number of years at that rate that we could sell. Uh, the recommendation is that, uh, that we do a, a tender or seek bids to purchase a, a large volume of this material, 2,500 cubic yards. Uh, put that out to uh, landscaping firms and anybody, I guess, who would be interested in that large volume and uh, see what we get for bids. So instead of us putting a price and, and acting as a retailer, we're going to act actually act more as an auctioneer. Of, of our finished compost. It will serve two purposes. Is one is it will clear up space uh, that will allow us to continue operations without, it, without that, uh, that problem, but it will also uh, put back into the community in, in one way or another the finished product uh, from everyone's diligence in, in separating their organics and sending, sending them off in the green cart. So uh, with Council's uh, approval, we would proceed with, with that uh, that sort of a uh, a sale. We have that as a motion. Jim, you have a question? I'll make that a motion that we support the uh, charge recommendation. I think it's a great way to attempt to sell. We couldn't sell it. I was going to give it away, but I'd like his approach better. Yeah. So okay. moved and seconded uh, by Councillor Don Barry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Contrary, Aye. you had something else to. Yeah, go ahead. So I uh, just wanted to add that you will, you will notice that we were reserving 1,000 cubic yards. And so that volume is, is for uh, our traditional spring giveaway with the planter workshop. So we'll have a volume for that. And we'll also have a volume available for, for householders or citizens that want to come out to the facility with a pickup truck or a container and buy a small volume. We'll still have 1,000 yards, which is uh, a very sufficient supply. Good, thank you. Uh, graduated uh, pricing scale. Jeff? Uh, Your Worship, I'd like to defer that item, but it is related to, uh, to the previous item, and that is our ability to move compost once it's completed and certified and ready for sale. Uh, we have uh, sold small volumes, but we think if we, if we have a graduated pricing scale that allows uh, large-scale purchasers to purchase at a a lower uh, cost per cubic meter that we may we may be able to sell on a more regular basis uh, fairly large volumes of the compost. So Good. I'm just advising you at this point that that uh, graduate scale uh, will be brought forward as a recommendation. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, uh, plastic contaminations in organic strategy. Request for decision. Jack. 
Your Worship, you can probably test, tell we've uh, been talking about compost a bit uh, in, in town hall. So this one is about the, um, the uh, amount of uh, non-organic material that we're finding within, within the compost uh, stream. Uh, we have been finding a, a very high volume of plastic and uh, that causes us um, significant issues. Uh, it starts with, um, we, we try, we have to have somebody, if you can imagine the stuff arriving, the organics, imagine your green cart, imagine 10 tons of that at a time arriving at a facility, getting dumped on a concrete floor, and you're the person in rubber boots and gloves that has to go through that and pull out plastic. Because once plastic is in, is in the, uh, the process, it is incredibly difficult to get it out. So the process goes that the, the, the organic material comes in, it's dumped, and is put on a conveyor, it goes through a grinding process. So any plastic bags or plastic utensils or other foreign non-organic matter gets cut up in that process into smaller pieces and now it's even more difficult to get out. The process takes about two years from the day we receive it until the day that we have cooled, uh, certifiable compost and at the point and dry enough that it, that it can be screened and, and certified. So when we go to screen it, we, we use a, an industrial screening machine and it cannot easily pick out um, those plastic bits. If when we, when we do our testing, we take a, a one liter random sample out of a, a windrow that might be, I don't know, uh, 50 to 100 feet long, six, seven feet high, we take a, a, a number of samples to send off to be certified. If there is a single piece of plastic in the sample, then the whole windrow is, is not certifiable as class A compost, can't be used for landscaping or, or for your home garden. It can be used for, for roadside or, or reforestation projects, but we don't have a lot of that going on. If there are two pieces of plastic, then it can't even be used for that. It cannot leave the site under any circumstances. So we end up in a situation where we have to re-screen that material. So it's very problematic. The easiest, the best way to avoid the problem is to not have plastics enter the waste stream in the first place. And so how do we do that? Through education, uh, the young people that, that are here today, uh, you know, they'll learn about, about uh, source separation in school and in, in their clubs and organizations like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides. I know they talk about that stuff in terms of environmental stewardship. stewardship. So we, we do education, but then sometimes uh, things do wind up in the green cart. We need, we need haulers and there are several municipal haulers. We need them to reject the green cart at the curb. Don't dump the stuff in the truck because as soon as it's in the truck, now it's our problem. So uh, we need to work with our haulers and there are six municipalities that bring their organics to our facility. So that's as many as six different haulers. Educate the people on the back of the truck who are just trying to get the job done that it's okay to leave the cart, which creates, a, I know it creates an awful problem for a householder to have your green cart around for an extra couple weeks, especially in summer. But if you don't separate your organics properly, you're creating a problem down the road for somebody else and that somebody is, is us. The final thing is we need the municipalities to engage and, and make sure that their haulers, that, that their pain are doing their job. And one way that I know we can get municipalities' attention is increasing the cost of dumping the contaminated material on our tipping floor. So I'm asking for your support to, to allow us to double tipping fees when we find that there's, there's contaminate, contaminating non-organic material, such as plastic, within the loads that we receive at the compost facility. And just as an example, um, I did reach out to one of my colleagues this week with a picture and a letter. And the letter said, you know, we need your help. Here's what we're finding. He was shocked by the amount of plastic. It was just a picture of the pile of plastic that we pulled out. He was shocked. And the, the message was that we're, we're considering many measures, including potentially doubling the cost when loads are contaminated. I got emails and I got phone calls. They're on it, right? Because nothing is, is going to get their attention more than the money, more than the, money yeah. the payer. Because this is tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, our, our customers 
right now are charged something in the area of $600,000 a year in tipping fees to bring their organics to us. If that were to double to 1.2 million because they couldn't get the separation done, you can imagine, you know what that would do to our bottom line. So that's, that is what I'm asking for your support is to, is to have a bit of a hammer at the end of the process here. If education doesn't work and, and you know, getting, rejecting green cards through, through uh, educating our, our haulers, that we need the ability to, to increase the bill. Because here's, here's the cost to us. We've increased the size of our, of our holding pads. We're required to have engineered pads to hold this material on at the compost facility for two years after it goes through our, our plant. As that space fills up, because we can't get this stuff certified, we have to build larger pads, which cost us engineering time and money and getting approvals for bigger pads. Construction cost of building those pads. If we have to rescreen material, you know, we rent a trommel screener and, and there's one in our capital budget, which you'll see shortly. They're not cheap. They're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Rescreening that material is labor and machine time, and that's, that's our only option once the, once the plastic is in there. So um, it, it's a lot easier to deal with this problem at the source, and I think we'll get everybody's attention and cooperation if the, if the cost of failure is the doubling of the tipping fees. So I'm asking for your support to... to uh, enable that policy there's not uh, when they come into the drop off the load uh, there's no question where that truck came from right so they can't say that that might have been that no. might have been from somewhere else right so so when the truck arrives and, and uh, so when a truck comes in of course they come across a scale and they get the initial initial weight they dump the material they go back over the scale and they get they, they get the empty weight and the yep. difference is how much we charge uh, Everyone, including the town of Yarmouth, has their own hauler contract. And so our hauler, um, you know, they go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they take organics to the facility. It's, it's known uh, whose load it is because we have to send a bill anyway, right? So they tell us this is the town of Yarmouth organics. The person in the scale house will charge this to the town of Yarmouth. So, so there's no question the, the fellow driving the truck, or lady, whichever the case may be, tells the scale house operator whose load it is, whose contract it is, and once the material is, is out of the truck, that's the only time we get a look at it. It is on our floor by the time we get a look at it. So doubling the tipping fees, I think, is... is it, some will it, feel it's a bit drastic, it, but there's... It'll get there's, the problem solved in a hurry, too. There is there's attention needed here. Councilman McClive. <clears throat> Do the other... I have a couple of comments. Uh, do the other municipalities are aware of of your desire, and and when did you hope to implement uh, the process? And, uh, <clears throat> and and you started off by doubling the existing dollar amount. Um, I wonder if there's also going to be. Um, if in the end, uh, our local hauler, I think of the town of Yarmouth, uh, if it will cost us more for garbage pickup uh, down the road, if they had, to, if they, if the staff have to spend more time sorting, just looking for comments and. and, and so on the hauler contracts, Your Worship, um, on the hauler contracts, uh, that's already a requirement for all of the haulers, whether they're picking up green carts or blue bags or clear bags, is to look at what they're what they have there and to, and to be confident that it's properly sorted. If it's not properly sorted, they have stickers that are provided by waste check and they put a sticker on, on the cart or on the bag and they say it's not properly sorted and it's up to the, to the um, property owner to take it back and, and get it right for the next time. Um, as far as when uh, I would see this implemented, realizing that the policy wouldn't be approved until the December 12th council meeting, I would say February, February 1st would be the earliest because we want to work with, with Waste Jack. We want to work with our customers, give them an opportunity to speak to their haulers, to get some messaging out to their residents. <coughs> Excuse me, Mike um, Carter, our communications officer, has been already in contact with Waste Jack and, and uh, uh, getting uh, some educational materials from them that we can use ourselves but we are just one municipality, so we need, we need six municipalities using these same materials 
and getting the message out to their residents and, and their haulers. So February 1st should be enough time to start to, to have a difference. But I think when you start rejecting carts at the curb, you, well, it's winter, so it's not as big an inconvenience as if it were July, right? So if you start rejecting them in February, um, you know, the message will get through and hopefully by the time warmer weather comes around, we have a much uh, better compliance, compliance rate. Ultimately, that's how the municipalities will save themselves money, is by having the hauler reject the cart at the curb so the plastic never gets into the stream. We don't have to double bill and, uh, and the resident gets the message that if they want their organics taken away, they have to do a better job at source separation. And there may be people who don't want us to say this, um, but if you, have, if you have something that you don't want to separate, you've got something really gross and icky in a plastic bag, and you're trying to decide where that should go, do not put it in the green cart. Put it in the clear bag. If you're not going to separate it, it's garbage and it goes in the clear bag. Good, let's make a motion, Jim. Well, I'll make a motion that we support uh, our CAO's recommendation. I don't have to read that, yep. it's all there. Yep. So uh, I'll gladly make that motion. Okay, Council, uh, second by Council Steve Berry. Uh, questions been called, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Uh, request for presentation from Splash Park Committee, Councillor Barry. So, uh, Deputy Mayor and I were at a meeting Wednesday night, was it? Uh, uh, went, no. Tuesday? Uh, Monday night. Monday night, yes. And um, there's been some progression Monday in night, the, uh, the Splash Park. There's a group uh, headed up by um, Linda Gallagher. And uh, long story short, they're basically at the point now where they want to get some traction and uh, get some support from... Uh, local councils pick a spot and whatnot, but they'd like to give a presentation to us. So they asked if uh, we would make a motion that at our next council meeting that they'd be allowed to present. Or the earliest possible yes. date, right? Yep. So Lindsay, we'll um, move by Councillor Barry, seconded by... Oh, he made the motion. Yep. Seconded by Don. So I think we'll, the only thing is Councillor Barry, I think at the earliest possible date, Lindsay, if that's... Acceptable, we can do that? Okay, good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Thank you, Councillor Barry. Um, uh, F, 8F Capital. Is that going to be Jerry? I guess to start off, um, got a capital list that we're looking at and I've had meetings with uh, the different directors, the various directors and our engineering department to discuss what we had from last year. So gone through with their input and reviewed it with CAO uh, and have a, a list, a proposal for you. So I oh. have it here uh, in the paper copy uh, today. And what I'd like to do is at least explain how this, how the sheet is you organized. Do you have copies? Yep. I'm, Good. Just gonna, I'm just going to explain how the sheet is organized um, uh, so you can understand it because like I said I will request uh, another meeting in a couple weeks to kind of go through it all. Thanks, Chair. Yo. Here, give me a chair. Give me one extra, I'll put it in Pam's desk. So what I've done, uh, learning from past experience, the first sheet is just the list in total. And I know that's a little bit small print. So for your convenience, I've printed it bigger on the attached on the back. 
<laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying I've had the comment in the past. It's kind of hard to read. So if you want to look at the second page, it's probably just as easy. So what, what we've done is we've organized the capital projects um, in that first column. So what I've done is numbered the columns as well, one through seven. So I just want to explain how those work. So column one is a little bit of the more complicated piece. Uh, those are budgets uh, that are remaining that have been approved from prior years. So I've gone and taken the budgets from the past five, six years, anything that's not been used or completed to date, and that's, those are the amounts that are uh, unspent at this point. So if you looked at uh, the, first, the first six projects are actually completed, but some were uh, two are over budget from prior years and one's uh, under budget. So the first one, the server upgrades, that's being done this year. Uh, we've spent about 28000 on server and computer upgrades this year. Uh, so I'm able to lump, because we're doing all that as one big project, I can lump that as a capital project. Uh, so in column one, you'll see a negative 28163 When you go down to the uh, project number three, which does the... Uh, vehicle exhaust extraction system at the fire hall. Uh, we had budgeted, I think it was 90,000, and it came in at 83,000. So there's 7,156 left of that budget that was unused. So that's how that column one works. It's a net balance of what was, has been approved and unspent at this point. So when I was talking with uh, uh, the department managers, uh, directors, and the engineers, I've come up with column two, which is some budget that we would like to reallocate. So, for instance, if you look at the bottom of that first page, so the numbers 27 and 20, 28, uh, we had budgeted uh, from an approved prior years a fair bit of money for the Kilomorph assessment and for the Glebe Street garage demolition, which won't be necessary. So, from our engineers, he, they figure that uh, we would have about 400,000 from the Killam Wharf assessment and 600,000 from the Glebe Street garage demolition that will not be necessary or to use for those projects. So in, in that column two, you'll see that I've, I've taken those, those amounts and redistributed them to other projects that need extra money. So that's how column two would work. I'm missing a page here. So the big one is in, in, on the third page, um, project number 37, uh, which is the big project we're looking to do next year or get started next year, which is the Glebe Street Stone Sewer Separation Project. So we'd like to take 700000 of that million dollars and allocate it to that project. So that's column two. Column three... Um, is actually the plan for the, the next fiscal year. So those, that's the money that we'd be looking to have approved from council uh, for capital spending. So in column three, you'll see uh, the first one is, on, is down to number 26, which is the Broad Street or Broad Brook channel clearing project. So we've had 216,000 left from prior budgets, but we know at this point or our looking at a cost more in the 500,000 range. So we'll, we, want, we want to add 300,000 out of the current, or upcoming year for that. So that's how that plan for 2021 is what we're looking to get done. Okay. Good. Follow uh, along so far. Okay. So I, I put, and we put a little less emphasis uh, on uh, our plan for 21, 22, 22, 23, and 23, 24, because things do change. Um, some projects will get pushed and, and uh, dollar amounts will be adjusted as we get closer to those projects. But these are all pro those are all projects that are on our radar to get done over the next three or four years. Good, any questions for Jerry? We're gonna have a meeting before Christmas. So like I said, I think the best thing to do, we'd like to have this uh, go to council and on the 12th. So we're hoping that, you know, we might be able to, available to or able to meet on the 10th or 11th. 
uh, to go through this in a little more detail with council and with when the, maybe all the council can be here. And, and also by then we should have a little bit of a plan on our, our uh, budget, operating budget as well. Good. Yeah, we'd like to have the capital plan approved in December so engineering can get on with getting the engineering work done. Good, thank you, Jerry. Any questions for Jerry? Go ahead, Jeff. So, Your Worship, I think it would be, uh, be great if uh, over the next couple of weeks if councillors could uh, review the list and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, either bring them to the budget, budget meeting. If you want answers quicker, you can channel your questions either through the Director of Finance or myself. We'll be happy to, to reach down into the departments and get answers for how, you. Uh, how, how fluid is the list, Jeff, if, if we have a presentation or somebody... Uh, I'm just thinking maybe uh, maybe the Splash Park people are farther along than what we thought. Yep. So and, and, and what's the what's the cutoff line? Because uh, if they have everything ready to go and some of the federal and provincial dollars line up, uh, what's the what's the date for this? Okay. So uh, what isn't fluid would be items that were on the list that were that were safety related. Okay. So yeah. we. Yep. If it's a safety issue, we, we, we don't Do want it. to mess with it. We want yep. to get it done. Yep. Um, but there is, there is a fair amount of flexibility on projects that haven't yet been, been initiated, that haven't started or been tendered. Uh, some items, you know, we've, we've pushed or pulled forward or backward, depending on, on the desires of, of, of council. So if another project um, were to, to emerge, uh, it's, it's fairly easy for us given, so if you look at, at the bottom of page two, yeah, I was just or, gonna point or the, back, the back page of Jerry's uh, presentation, you'll see that column one, we have $5 million of, of uh, projects and equipment to execute that the money's already been allocated, has been from previous budgets, including this, this current fiscal year. Uh, we're looking at an additional 3.175 that we're asking you to approve for next fiscal, so in all, you're talking about eight million dollars worth of projects uh, uh, and equipment. So, you know, for for a relatively small, um, I say relatively small because I think it, in the big it, picture it's relatively small. Yeah. Uh, if somebody were to secure, or if we saw an opportunity to secure matching funds through a new, through new program or an opportunity, you know, if we if we can spend fifty cent dollars instead of hundred cent dollars of, of town taxpayers money well then we need to adjust the plan so yep. if there's an opportunity to to leverage a community to 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 get a community asset by leveraging higher levels of government then we always we always kind of put that as a as a, a second priority <coughs> after after safety so there's flexibility yeah. what we're looking for though is a plan so our engineering department largely takes lead on these projects and and you know, they need to, to get going with, with uh, creating uh, designs and uh, developing specifications and getting the work ready to, to be uh, tendered and executed. So uh, this becomes their, their plan and uh, not to say that uh, they can do everything all at once. So there is some, there is yep. some fluidity. Good. Yeah. So a couple more comments just before we leave the, the capital sheets. Uh, just to, just to mention, in particular, items 14, 15, and 16 is on the compost theme. These were, these were projects um, from prior years that we talked about having to do, and for different reasons, they were deferred and delayed. Uh, but it's been top of mind, I guess, recently. Uh, so as far as the capital budget goes, we just wanted to keep those three amounts there. And I know uh, Chad and the engineers are working on coming up with a plan to figure out what our solution might be. Uh, so it may not be those three items, but there's gonna be something to do with compost. So we wanna just hold those funds there for that. So whether that's the right amount or not, we're unsure, but we want to hold that. Uh, further down on the page, uh, items 37, 38, 39, 40, those, those four items, uh, well, the first three, 37 to 39, 
are kind of wrapped up in the one project uh, doing the Glebe Street sewer separation. So the plan would be with phase one would be go from Water Street up and around the corner on Main Street. So you would just touch on parade. So in doing so, <coughs> excuse me. In doing so, we'd be doing the, the traffic lights and also the bump outs. Good. <coughs> Any questions? I know we've always done very well at uh, partnering money with our federal and provincial counterparts is how we do a lot of it. And we wait until the project is right and the alignment is right and we always do very well. Any other questions or comments? You're going to come back with some dates, Jerry, and we'll yeah, figure it out. Go, go ahead. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, considering uh, there's there's a fair amount of information here to to digest, uh, and we do have a council meeting on on December the 12th. So, we're we're targeting. We'd like to have be in a position to consider uh, approving the capital budget for December 12th. So that means we need to have a committee of the whole meeting to go through this in detail. Uh, I'm looking at the 10th or the 11th and in the afternoon, maybe at 3.30. And the reason I'm suggesting those dates, our director of finance is, is, is away next week. And um, it, I think it's important that he be here. Uh, and I'm equally, I think it's important that it be before the 12th. So uh, if someone wants to make a suggestion on either, either one of those dates. Go ahead, Jim. Um, Jeff, we were talking about a <clears throat> waterfront committee meeting on, on Wednesday the 11th, I think, at uh, 4.30. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with earlier in the day or I'm okay with, uh, with Tuesday afternoon at 3.30ish. Tuesday would be a better idea. Okay. Yeah, so, probably. So tu Tuesday at 3.30 is when, but I want to hear from the rest of the boys. We'll get in touch with Lindsay. <coughs> okay, good. Thank you. Good, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Uh, Communities in Bloom, Councillor Cleveland. Thank you, uh, thank you, Deputy. Um, it's just one thing that uh, uh, we had happen during our uh, committee meeting, which just went by. Uh, we're looking actually to expand our committee slightly. And I'll explain the reason why. During the Communities in Bloom symposium itself, um, and actually in other things as well, uh, the members of the Garden Club have been a huge asset to Communities in Bloom. And they work together in, in, uh, in conjunction with each other. And so we made a motion last night at our committee meeting that the Communities in Bloom committee uh, would recommend to council that a couple of additional seats for the garden club would be created what for you, the committee. I guess it was two, one, 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 additional, additional one additional seat so that there would be yeah. two seats um, because there already is one spot for the garden club, but that would, if we would have another additional seat, so two members for the garden club. So we're looking for an expansion of one for the committee. And I don't know if there's uh, any kind of uh, uh, motion that needs to be made or any of that, but that's what we're Go looking ahead, for. Jeff. Just a uh, question of clarification. Um, has communities, communities in Bloom incorporated as a society? Good question. I don't know the answer. Do you? I don't know the answer. This is like our local. This is, this is town, our community. This is a town committee. committee. Okay, so that's separate from the group that. That's did different the from conference. the symposium. Okay. okay. This, is a town, this is a town yeah. appointed okay. committee. Okay. Uh, Councilor McLeod. So I'm. I'm, a, I'm good with that. I'm very good with that. However, I'd like to suggest, as I've been talking for about uh, a number of years now, committee makeup, do we always have to have a town citizen on a committee when, for example, I know the lady that Jeff, that Wade is speaking about, and, uh, and she's in charge of the garden club, and she'd be a wonderful addition to the committee. She attends the committee meetings, and she contributes but can't vote. So why can't we allow citizens of our town and county to be members of committees which originate in the town? And I think the, 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 
the talk around the table last night is if she's appointed from the uh, Yarmouth Garden Club, it has an opportunity for somebody outside the town to come and participate because the, the community, the, the, that's what we're trying to do. And you can see it on, on the committee that we sit on, Council McLeod, is heritage is we have uh, uh, two, Michael Morris and we have um, Randy Sonia that do own property in town but live at, living outside our boundaries. Uh, the Mariner Center, one of our appointments was Mike Randall, uh, who lives outside of town. So we do have opportunities to appoint people that don't live in the town to some of our committees. So I'm not going to hold up the committees in bloom desire, I think. I, I guess it was a motion that was approved by the committee last night. But I would like a, a longer look at our desire, at my desire to have uh, people who want to act on committees that happen to originate in town perhaps live in Hebron or Tuscat. We, we have done a fairly good job with that, but... Uh, Wade, are you good? Yes. Okay, turn her off, man, and Jeff. So, Your Worship, um, I'm looking for, and I can't put my eyes on it at this moment, but it seems to me that we did amend a policy around appointment of citizens. Uh, now, before I get into that, let me say that you can do whatever you wish. Uh, as long as you do it through policy. So you have a citizens advisory committee policy which identifies communities in bloom and identifies how many citizen members there are. So if you make a motion here to uh, amend that policy to, to allow for, then we will take that direction, amend the policy, bring it back December 12th and it's done. But gen more generally speaking, uh, we did talk about uh, at the council table a few years ago, the idea that, that there are great people who are stakeholders in this community but don't actually happen to live right in the town of Yarmouth. And so we did make a provision in one of our policies to allow uh, people to sit on our advisory committees if they were a, a uh, owner or a director on a company that, that uh, board of directors that, that operated within the town. So it, it opened it up to the business community essentially uh, who, who pay a lot of taxes and are certainly stakeholders. In this case, you, you know, you, there, is no, there is no limitation on your ability except uh, what you choose through policy. So make a motion to, to uh, do what you want to do and we'll, we'll make it happen. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That makes much more sense. So I would like to make a motion to expand the uh, committee uh, communities in bloom by one, uh, adding another member from the Garden Club. Who's the second? Who's the second? Okay. And, <laughs> and <laughs> that they need not be a resident. A member of, of the, the town of Yarmouth. Yeah. Need not be a, a resident member of, the garden. of Yarmouth. Of the town of Yarmouth. So sec move to second. Any other questions or concerns? Jimmy, all right? I know you want to jump in there. We're, we do pretty good. You, all you got to do is you, you talked about the Waterfront Development Corporation and look around the table and how many, how many residents of the municipality sit around there, right? Heritage, how many sit around there? Uh, communities in Boom, we're going to have the opportunity for that. Uh, the Mariner Center Board, we're, we're expanding our borders, so we are doing well. <laughs> Amalgamation, I know. Amalgamation. <laughs> That's right, and I think we're doing well. Uh, questions been called, I think I heard it from over there. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary, uh, motion is passed, thank you. I think expansion was the Mariner Center, but I think Councillor Hood is not here, so maybe we can bring that up at another time, uh, CAO. Uh, Correspondence for action, Temple Baptist Church re-tipping fees. Um, I think maybe CAO, do you want to start on this one? I got it. What's your call? I got a copy if you want to read. Uh... Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. So we have a, uh, a letter here from the Temple Baptist Church, and as you can see, uh, they have a plan to demolish a house attached to their community center at 7 Bond Street. 
and uh, they their the request is that as a not-for-profit organization they're asking if the town could could waive the disposal fees or the tipping fees as we call them in order that they continue to put their resources into uh, supporting their mission within within the town and as they say they uh, they have a number of things they do they, in the past year they provided an AA room they've hosted second chance seniors and so on they talk about the things they've done that are all good good acts of kindness within the community uh, and generosity um, the issue is this uh, your worship is that uh, we are not the sole owners of the construction demolition debris site. We are a one-third owner, uh, and uh, and so we don't actually have the authority to to uh, waive fees for the waste park. Uh, the waste park is its own corporate entity. Uh, if you want to provide a grant uh, where they are not for profit, you you could do that. You could make a recommendation. Uh, to consider it at the at the waste park board of directors, which represents all three owners, uh, but I don't believe you have the authority on your own, unless you're willing to provide the grant to cover the fees. Uh, you can't fully, don't, fully and, satisfy this request. And we don't know how much it is right now. No, but and I can give you a little insight into that uh, because we've done a number of demolitions of of houses that we've acquired through through tax sale. Uh, this could be in the area of ten thousand dollars this uh, would be this is a fairly large residence it's mm -hmm. the old glee house at the notre dame church plus the other side of the coin is uh we have uh, waste diversion credits through um divert nova scotia so we go above and beyond a certain tonnage um over the year there could be four or five or six residences that get demolished in the town of yarmouth or the municipality they go through, we have a, uh, an allotment that we get funded back for. So if we go over and above that, we don't get, we get about $100,000 a year in waste diversion credits. And if we exceed that limit, we have money taken off. So if we have three or four properties that we don't charge for the demolition or demolition going through, um, if they exceed the limits, uh, we get double tax. So we could, we could actually, if it could be 15,000, we could actually, could lose because of the overages, we could lose 15,000 again in diversion credits. So that not only affects the town of Yammer, that affects uh, district or, or area seven, which incorporates uh, six municipal units. So that, that's another problem. We, we solved the problem uh, through a monetary transaction with the uh, Yarmouth Area Industrial Commission, the demolition of the, of the uh, old cotton mill, and we wiped out our $100,000 Payback, like it was lost, like it cost us hundred thousand dollars. So this is, uh, if the other two people have to have a look at this, but maybe correspondence goes back that we're not the sole owner of the. You can refer this to the waste park. Okay, make a motion to refer to waste park, um, and they'll deal it with there because all municipal units will be sitting around the table. Yeah. Moved and second. A question. Okay. Question been called. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary. Uh, nine B Scott and Kelly Mitchell Reese Brucewood Playground. Uh, CAL. Uh, your Worship, uh, Council dealt with a request um, from uh, Mrs. Mitch, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell uh, two months ago uh, regarding a request to rename a park uh, playground within the town of Yarmouth. Uh, for their daughter who has passed and uh, Aiden May and council uh, made a motion to uh, refer them to our community asset donation program which we've set up uh, for people to be able to uh, recognize uh, or honor people of, of their choice um, and, and we have several examples of that in Frost Park and in other parks uh, throughout the town it, it has gone over very well um, so they received uh, a response from us saying that this was this was a decision of council and they they were aware of that program before the initial request they had met with Todd and uh, and I think they were well well aware of that opportunity but they they had a different idea so this letter is is asking uh, council to to reconsider uh, its decision on the renaming of the park
Foster also said we would like to sit down uh, with all of you and share our visions for Yarmouth's youth. So I don't know, uh, we cur currently operate off our own personal funds. So it looks like they're looking for a, another avenue to engage the town or maybe some town committees uh, to help support some youth activities. Councillor Jim, got some guidance please as, as always. Should this be addressed to staff first and to find out what actually they're looking for? I, I don't really, I know them well, but I don't know what they're asking for. And I wondered if it's, don't think it's proper for them to make a, uh, uh, a presentation to council. I think it becomes a staff, a staff request or a presentation and then a council and then a recommendation. Just, just any, throwing that out. Any thoughts on that, Jeff? Make, you want to make that a motion, Jim? So moved. Second. To consult with staff. To, 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 to uh, discuss it with the right, I'm not sure who, Jeff, the right staff person is. Uh, could be Todd or it could be uh, yep. Chad or Todd and Chad. Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. Good. Moved and seconded. Question. Oh, question called all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary? Uh, we have a motion to go in camera, please. We got anything else, Lynch? We good? One other item. Okay, Jeff, go ahead. Sorry, Your Worship, I, I should have added this to the agenda earlier. Um, this I, I have in front of me, and I apologize, you don't have a copy in front of you. But uh, Council will recall that every year at this time we receive a report from our town crier indicating the number of events that he has uh, been present and uh, and done his thing uh, on behalf of the town. And this year, uh, the list looks as long as ever, uh, probably 25 events or so. Uh, like 26 or 27. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, he provides this report, and so we do provide him a, 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 a mod a modest honorarium for, for his work. And so I look for a motion uh, to, to uh, remunerate the town crier and to thank him for his service. Moved by Councillor Barry, seconded by Councillor Cleveland. I have one, and you? one quick question. This is a shared cost, is it? I think he goes to the municipality and gets. I'm just curious, Jeff. Yeah, if, the, if we this, don't know, I'm, I'm just. Yeah, the, um, the events that I see listed here, uh, for the most part, are events within the town of Yarmouth. I assume he also receives some remuneration from the municipality of Yarmouth. Yeah. They would probably have fewer events. So for example, he did, he did the- uh, Dumping day. Yeah, dumping yeah. day. Yeah. 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 No, I'm supportive, but I've just, I just made the comment. Uh, motion to go in camera. So move seconded. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And for staying, yeah, thanks for staying. Thank you, everybody.